In recent years, my feeling is that AMD is fighting a losing battle against Nvidia. Although in theory the premises are good for a balanced battle, at last based on AMD's technological experience, and here I would only mention chiplet design and FSR, a direct competitor for DLSS, in practice the Red Camp cannot find any appealing selling points for consumers. I'm not saying it, the sales are. Thus, according to the latest Steam survey in August, Nvidia cards overwhelmingly dominate the market with a staggering 75% of all systems with Steam installed. AMD is at 16%, the rest being Intel integrated cards. If we analyze the study more closely, the most widespread AMD video card appears only in the 25th place, unless we count the APUs, and it is, guess what, RX 580. Yes, a card released six years ago. If we focus only on the cards from the current generation, the most popular desktop card is from Nvidia, namely RTX 4070 Ti, present in 0.83% of all systems. It's not a high figure, but if we look at the top AMD card from the new generation, 7900 XTX, we see next to it a percentage of 0.23% of all systems. Conclusions of the study? AMD not only has a lot to catch up in the mainstream card department, but also struggles in the mid, high-end sector, where you find models like RX 6700 XT, RX 6800 or RTX 4070, 4070 Ti. So the rather late release of Radeon 7700 XT and 7800 XT was eagerly awaited by us, the naive ones, who still hope there is a competition in the video card market. But before I talk about the cards, I'd like to talk a bit about the names. It seems that AMD is playing tricks with the names, non-XT, XT, XTX, which makes it even harder to identify the segment each card belongs to. For example, AMD considers the 7800 XT to be the successor to the RX 6800, not 6800 XT, as the name would have suggested. These changes are very confusing for a user who is not up to date with them, and overall I believe they damage AMD's brand image. Moving on, let's see where RX 7800 XT fits in. Being a successor to RX 6800, the new AMD card competes with RTX 4070, not 4070 Ti. Similarly, RX 7700 XT competes with RTX 4060 Ti. Confusing, isn't it? The situation gets even more interesting when we talk about prices, but we'll get to that later. Let's take it systematically and start with the architecture. Both Radeon 7700 XT and Radeon RX 7800 XT are based on the same RDNA 3 graphics architecture, like the entire RX 7000 series, and exploit the 5 nanometer EUV production node where it really matters the computing units and other rendering components. The cards use the new Navi 32 core based on chiplet technology, just like Navi 31, which powers the RX 7900 series. The chip design is hybrid with elements made on 6 nanometers technology and elements on 5 nanometers. AMD chose this approach to maximize the use of its factory on the more advanced 5 nanometers production node. Thus, they identified specific GPU components that benefit most from this newer node. Essentially, all computing components and components that don't benefit as much, such as the Infinity Cache memory and GDDR6 memory controllers. These are made in the form of memory cache cores, MCDs, on the older 6 nanometers mode. On Navi 32, we have four such cores compared to six on Navi 31, each with a 16 megabyte segment of the 64 megabytes Infinity Cache and a 64 bit GDDR6 memory interface. Let's take a closer look at the entire 7000 series, or at least what has been released from it so far. This is a very interesting approach when looking at the differences between 7700 XT and 7800 XT. RX 7800 XT uses the entire Navi 32 processor has four MCDs, meaning memory cache cores, while RX 7700 XT deactivates six computation units 
and one MCD. Regarding the theoretical specifications, RX 7800 XT has only 6% more GPU computing power than 7700 XT, but benefits from 44% more memory bandwidth and a 33% larger memory capacity. The theoretical consumption is only 7% higher and all these come with a relatively small price difference between RX 7700 XT and 7800 XT. Even before testing, I already have a favorite. Comparing them with the previous generation, both 7700 XT and its bigger sibling paradoxically have less cache memory. 6700 XT has 96 megabytes of cache versus 48 megabytes on 7700 XT and RX 6800 has 128 megabytes versus 64 megabytes on 7800 XT. However, the cache memory on the new boards uses the second generation of the Infinity Cache technology, which allows it to be significantly faster. Thus, if RX 6700 XT had a bandwidth of 1278 GB per second, the 7700 XT cache memory has a maximum transfer speed of 1995 GB per second. Mind you, we're talking about cache memory bandwidth. Similarly, 7800 XT comes with a bandwidth of 2708 GB per second versus 1432 gigabytes per second on RX 6800. Looking at the consumption, both boards consume more than the previous generation. Sure, the increases aren't large from 230 watts to 245 for 7700 XT and from 250 to 263 watts for 7800 XT. But if you compare these values with the green camp, things aren't looking great. But enough with the hardware, let's see what the new boards boast about on the software side. During the launch event for these cards, AMD unveiled finally the long-awaited Fidelity FX Super Resolution 3 and Fluid Motion Frames. FSR 3 is intended to be a technological rival to Nvidia's DLSS 3 with frame generation. The premise of both technologies is the same. To practically double the frame rate by generating intermediate frames without going through the entire graphic rendering process. The difference between FMF and frame generation is that while Nvidia uses a hardware component called an optical flow accelerator and the GPU's artificial intelligence to generate an intermediate frame without involving the entire graphic rendering process, FMF uses part of the graphic rendering process to approximate the interpolated frames. As with frame generation, FSR3 FMF adds a slight latency. Nvidia counteracts this drawback with Reflex, while AMD uses Radeon Anti-Lag Plus. A major advantage of FMF over frame generation is that it works on any modern DirectX 12 GPU that supports asynchronous processing, async compute, as it doesn't require a specific hardware component like frame generation does. If I were to be completely critical of Nvidia, it's the exact same behavior we see with monitors. FreeSync doesn't require dedicated hardware, whereas G-Sync technology does. That's why you'll find more monitors supporting FreeSync and at a better price than those supporting G-Sync. Returning to FSR 3, AMD also says that all Radeon GPUs from RX 5700 and up and all GeForce GPUs starting from the RTX 2000 series should support FSR 3 fluid motion frames. Also, integration with games is as easy as with FSR Two. The first games implementing FSR3 FMF should appear this fall. AMD is also working on expanding FMF at the driver level, allowing performance upscaling for games that don't support FSR. Need I remind you how closed and difficult to implement DLSS3 is in games? But this is a longer discussion because, at least so far, despite the shortcomings listed earlier, after all, Nvidia's approach has produced better quality results. I should also mention that the cards support DisplayPort 2.1, are capable of AV1 encoding, and like the other cards in the 7000 series, have dedicated AI accelerators. AMD chose not to build a reference version for the RX 7700 XT only for the RX 7800 XT. We still received third-party versions for both, specifically the Sapphire Pulse RX 7700 XT and the Gigabyte RX 7800 XT Gaming OC. These are implementations already available on the market, not unidentified objects. Let's take them one by one, starting with my favorite, the 7800 XT. Gigabyte's Gaming OC version has always been their mid-range, between the Windforce or Eagle versions and the Aorus versions. Thus, we benefit from a substantial radiator, supported by three fans, 
a touch of RGB, specifically the Gigabyte logo, and four outputs, two HDMI and two display ports. Both cards occupy three slots, as we've become accustomed to with recent mid-range and higher models. I'm somewhat relieved not to have received a reference version, and I say this from a cooling perspective. Gigabyte's RX 7800 XT measures 302 mm in length, 130 mm in width, and is 56 mm thick, compared to the reference version's dimensions of 267 mm in length, 110 mm in width, and 50 mm in thickness. Furthermore, the reference version only has two fans. Back to Gigabyte, the backplate is metallic and has thermal pads that make contact with the board. As usual with Gigabyte cards, there are screw holes at the end of the card for anti-sec bracket mounting, but unfortunately the bracket is not included in the package. Moving on to its smaller sibling, Sapphire's Pulse version is somewhat entry-level within the manufacturer's range, so you shouldn't expect the best cooling system or any extravagances. However, I find the design quite appealing. The card is dual fan, measuring 280 by 129 by 53 mm with a reasonably large radiator. The metal backplate also aids in cooling and the card's size makes it suitable for smaller cases. For those with older power supplies, I'm pleased to report that AMD hasn't reinvented the wheel regarding connectors. Both cards come with 2x8 pin connectors, the traditional connectors that were available back during the RX 580's time. Overall, I think these are successful implementations, at least from a design perspective. There's not much more to say here, thermal and acoustic performance are what matter in the end, and I will evaluate those shortly. Let's get now to the more interesting part, the tests. I'll start with the synthetic tests for those wanting to position these new cards in a hierarchy. I ran two programs, 3 d Mark and Blender, to see, at least theoretically, how the RX 7800 XT fares in gaming and productivity tasks. In gaming, the RX 7800 XT produced intriguing scores, in most cases higher than those obtained by its main competitor, the RTX 4070. However, in Blender, its scores fell significantly short of both the RTX 4070 and its own bigger sibling, the RX 7900 XT. I've included both direct competition and the RX 6800 in the results table to give you an idea of the RX 7800 XT XT's performance. Tests were conducted on an AM5 system with a Ryzen 9 7950X and 32GB of RAM at 6000 MHz. The synthetic test results were confirmed in gaming, where the RX 7800 XT has a comfortable lead over both the RTX 4070 and the RX 6800. I tested the card in 4 games with maxed out settings at 2 resolutions, 1440p, and 4K. I also tested with ray tracing in three of the games since this technology is becoming increasingly popular and is featured in most new games. I added the RX 6800 to the table to see the progression from one generation to the next, as well the RTX 4070, its direct competitor. I mentioned that the RX 7800 XT clearly wins, but it does depend on the game. For example, in Metro Exodus, the RTX 4070 managed to outperform the one here, but out of the four games tested, the RTX 4070 had more FPS in just one. The situation changed dramatically when ray tracing was activated. In this case, the RX 7800 XT was decisively beaten at all resolutions and in all tested games, with differences compared to the RTX 4070 sometimes reaching 30% lower, of course. Here are the results. The conclusions are pretty clear, I think. Except for cases where ray tracing is a must for you, the RX 7800 XT is the better card. It doesn't touch the RTX 4070 Ti, that's the job of the RX 7900 XT. However, from what I tested, the RX 7800 XT clearly surpasses the RTX 4070 in non-ray tracing game performance. The progress compared to the previous generation is also remarkable, if we accept the idea that the RX 7800 XT is the successor to the RX 6800, not the 6800 XT. Now, let's also touch on the topic of temperatures and power consumption. I expected the temperatures to be good, given that this is a third-party version of the card. However, the temperatures were even better than I hoped. Excuse me, but the last time I saw such low temperatures was during the test of the RTX 4090 FE, which has a cooler as big as my home radiator. Well, not that the one on the 7800 XT is smaller. In gaming, the temperatures were even slightly lower, around 60 
61 degrees Celsius. However, the maximum power consumed 251 watts compared to the 193 watts for the RTX 4070 shows that AMD cards are not as efficient as Nvidia's. I would describe the noise level as quite low. On an open bench, with my ear less than a meter from the card, the noise was never annoying. If you press your ear to the card, you can hear some coil whine, but it's certainly not noticeable when the card is inside a case. I also tested the Sapphire Pulse RX 7700 XT a bit because I wouldn't leave you hanging. For this one, I included two relevant cards for comparison. RTX 4060 Ti 8 gig and RX 6700 XT. Here are the results in synthetic tests. Good heavens, what a shame it brings to the RTX 4060 Ti. In fact, the 7700 XT even comes dangerously close to the RTX 4070, surpassing it in some situations where rasterization is the primary factor. In Port Royal, a modern test that also uses ray tracing, the RX 7700 XT isn't as cheeky, but still surpasses the RTX 4060 Ti with a 10% lead. Does this translate to games? Mostly yes. I only tested two titles here, Cyberpunk 2077 and Red Dead Redemption, both in 1440p and 4K. In Cyberpunk, I also activated ray tracing just for fun, even though it was clear that the card wouldn't handle even 1440p. It's clear, even from these limited results, that Nvidia needs to seriously rethink their pricing if they don't want to lose market share in the Radeon RX 7700 XT segment. I haven't tested the 16 gig version of the RTX 4060 Ti, but I doubt it would have changed my conclusions. Maybe in the 4K range, it would have performed slightly better, but otherwise, I think it's a win for Team Red. Another clear conclusion is that the RX 7700 XT is not a 4K card. Even in 1440p, the card sometimes dangerously approaches the 60 FPS limit, so I would especially recommend this card for 1080p. Let me also briefly touch on temperatures and consumption. The consumption is still around 230 watts, and it's still quite far from what Nvidia achieves. Even compared to the RTX 4070, the card consumes more, which, well, I expected. Nvidia is undoubtedly the efficiency champion. However, the temperatures are quite good. The Sapphire Pulse RX 7700 XT is more or less in the same temperature range as the Gigabyte RX 7800 XT Gaming OC. And that's good news, considering that the cooling is smaller and it's a dual fan solution. In conclusion, the Radeon RX 7700 XT, although inferior in FPS price ratio to the RX 7800 XT, is still a good proposition compared to the 4060 Ti, especially for rasterized games. And the RX 7800 XT represents a similar offering in the mid-range segment. And in addition to its good performance relative to its price, the card puts pressure on Team Green especially on the RTX 4070. This means that we might see some price adjustments from Nvidia in the upcoming period, if they still care a bit about competition. Without being revolutionary, the launch of the 7700 XT and the 7800 XT cards is a timid step in the right direction. That of offering users more performant products at reasonable prices. And now, you tell me in the comments section. How do you find the new graphics cards from AMD? And last but not least, if you were to choose with your own money, would you go for these models or for the equivalent ones from Nvidia? And why? Subscribe to Technicalities and take care.